Welcome to the Entrepreneur's MBA, bringing you lessons from real-life entrepreneurs they don't teach in business school. Here's your host, business coach and marketing strategist, Adam Kipnis. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Entrepreneur's MBA. I am your host, Adam Kipnis, learning lessons from everyday entrepreneurs that you're not going to learn in business school. I'm super fired up for uh, today's guest. I think there's a lot that we're going to learn from life, business, and athletics all wrapped into one. Uh, my next guest and I met at Eric Swanson's Habitude Warriors Conference last week in Scottsdale. That's HabitudeWarriorConference.com. He's got another event coming up in D.C. during the summer and then one in uh, Scottsdale again in August. So definitely check that out. Um, but I saw this gentleman speak. We met and I knew his story um, will resonate really well. He's a two-time Olympian for uh, – Sorry, back-to-back USA national champion in gymnastics, world all-around bronze medalist, captain of the 2012 Olympic team, six-time NCAA champion, and that's just what he's done in the gymnastics world. He was also an American Ninja Warrior finalist, for those of you who watched that awesome show. He speaks on stages now all over the world and telling his story and what it means to get to the top of the world in gymnastics and also attribute that to the business world. May I introduce to you Jonathan Horton. Jonathan, thanks for being here. Hey, Adam. Hey, thanks so much for having me on the show. Uh, pumped to talk to you a little bit about myself, share my story with you and, and our listeners. And for those listeners out there that haven't heard of me, don't know much about gymnastics, maybe Ninja Warrior, everybody feel free. Go check me out on some of my social media links, you can uh, find me on Instagram at jhorton11. On Twitter, is j underscore horton11. And then feel free to go check out my website at jonathanhorton.net just to put a name to a face. That's awesome. I uh, definitely encourage everyone to go out and, and just learn more and, and see what he's doing. He's doing some cool things. And uh, just the background of being a champion in a sport and to take it a little away from business, but um, into just being super successful, how did you, or what do you attribute your, your focus and your drive to get to that level of success? Is that something you're born with, or is it something that you had to work on daily? Well, you know, I actually feel like it's a little bit of a combination. I do think that there's a, um, you know, there's, there's definitely something that some people just have. It's like they're born with this spark, but I 100% believe that you can develop the uh, the mindset to become a champion at whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're an entrepreneur, um, you know, out chasing real estate or an athlete. Uh, you know, for me, I had to build myself, you know, mentally and physically throughout my sport. It wasn't always easy. And, uh, you know, it, it took me a really long time to accomplish my goals. You know, I did gymnastics for 28 years and uh, it took every single ounce of energy mentally and physically to get where I wanted to go. That's amazing in that you were that you were able to do it for that long and keep up the mental stamina and the drive. Um, did any sort of tips that that you used when when you were feeling a little bit down or when things weren't you just didn't want to go to the gym that day? Anything yeah. that you used in order to, to to get yourself up? Well, I'll take you back just kind of the beginning of my story a little bit. You know, I um, I got started in the sport when I was four years old. And, uh, you know, kind of a wacky story. I actually, my mom uh, lost me in the middle of a Target department store. I had actually, I climbed a, uh, a 25 foot support beam in the middle of the store and kind of, you know, wowed a bunch of people. And, uh, you know, it took like 10, 15 minutes for everybody to find me at the top of that thing. But, you know, I had, I had a little bit of natural, I guess, I, for lack of a better word, freakish ability. And uh, my parents ended up putting me in gymnastics. But, you know, when they put me in the sport, that that ability that they I guess they thought it wasn't quite there. I wasn't the most talented kid in the world, and um, you know I, I I really struggled to learn the sport for for a very long time. I didn't actually win my first competition until I was almost 16 years old. But the big moment that changed everything for me was actually when I was 10. Uh, when I was 10, I remember watching my very first Olympic Games, and I watched the women's gymnastics team win the gold medal, which was beyond exciting. I remember watching Carrie Strzok do a vault on a broken ankle to secure the gold medal. 
and it just it inspired me. It made it it created a why for me. I was I I told myself while I was watching that just glued to the screen. Hey, that's that's what I'm gonna do. Like I it's people are out there winning medals and becoming the best in the world at their at their sport. That's really really cool. Uh, I mean that that's got to be available to me, right? I just need to go figure out how to get it done. And so anytime I was struggling, you know, the best tip I can give people is. I had a visual why. I had a visual goal and a dream. I had seen something else that someone did that I wanted to do. And any time that I started struggling or, you know, failing or wanting to quit, I thought back of that visual moment. And I have people ask me all the time the same question, how do I stay inspired? How do I stay motivated? And I say, if you don't have something to look at or to watch, something that kind of resets your the fire – in your in in your belly, it, you can't motivate yourself. You're just you're you're going blindly throughout life, throughout you know world, and and you don't know exactly what you want. I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew what it looked like. I knew what it was going to feel like. I knew what other people were going to see it as. And I just it's almost like I could taste it. I could taste that that gold medal, that Olympic medal, and it's because I had seen someone else do it. Now I just need to figure out how they got there. That's really cool, and that's, that's and that that attributes to um, life and business. Whether it, it's getting a promotion in a current job, whether it's um, starting your own business, whether it's taking your business to new heights, having that that prize that you know that you want and you already feel that you have it. Um, well, yeah, you know, I just I kind of look at it as I, in my mind there was. There was no doubt. I, I, was, I was so bad at gymnastics when I first got started. I was, you know, maybe one of those kids at the top 20 on my best day ever. I wasn't the guy that started out winning all the medals and the trophies and the ribbons. But in my mind, I kept telling myself over and over again, they did it. Uh, they, and this may sound a little arrogant, but I think you have to almost be a little overconfident, have a little arrogance to yourself to get anywhere. But I just kept telling myself, if they can do it, I'm just as good as them. I can figure this out. And I think that we all have to have that confidence in our mind, even if we're not good enough, continue to tell ourselves every single day, hey, I am. They did it. I can do it. Okay, next day. All right, I know I'm not doing it yet, but they did it. I can do it. And you just It's a constant affirmation of that it's got to be possible. If someone else has accomplished something, it's got to be possible. Even if you don't get to that same exact level one day, you keep telling yourself you might get close, and that's what's important. It, it is, and, and that, that brings up a, a question and I believe a story that you have. In, in your journey, there were times when you got to the highest levels of, uh, of gymnastics, whether it was on your, your college team or, or in the Olympics, and you um, didn't have your best day out there. And that ended up you know, hurting your teammates. And, yeah. you know, can you tell us just a little bit about that, sir? I know, I know you do it in your speeches and we don't have time to do the entire thing, but if you can give us sort of those nuggets and, and how you um, came back and, and the support you had from your team would be awesome. Yeah. So um, I think the, the, the most infamous story of my entire career, <laughs> something I try to forget about, but it's probably the most valuable moment that ever happened to me was in 2006. I was a sophomore in college at the University of Oklahoma, and although it took me a really long time to kind of rise in the sport, I had finally done it at that point. I was one of the best gymnasts in the entire country. I was the NCAA collegiate national champion, and I had I'd really arrived. Like I, Everybody finally knew who I was, and people were expecting me to do a lot of great things in the sport of gymnastics at this point. And so at that year, we had a, a competition called the World Championships. We've got World Championships before the Olympic Games. And um, basically, if you can make the world team, you're good enough to make the Olympic team. Well, I made my first world team. And in my mind, in everyone else's mind, I was about to go to the world championships. I was about to become a world champion. I was going to lead my team to this glorious victory. And, you know, all was going to be gravy for Team USA. Well, I ended up leading my team to the worst performance in the history of USA Men's Gymnastics. Uh, I fell six times on four different uh, routines, and we ended up finishing in a pretty abysmal 13th place. No team had ever done as poorly up to that point or still now. That was the worst performance ever, even to this day. And the worst part about it was 
no one else on my team made any mistakes. I was the only guy that just fell all over the place. I was supposed to be the best. I was supposed to be the rock on the team. And I just, you know, it was, uh, I don't even know how to explain it because I, it, I don't even know what happened when I was there, but I just bombed event after event after event. And at that point, you know, I, the United States gymnastics lost all trust in me. Nobody wanted to associate with me. Uh, you know, people were talking about how I'd never become an Olympian because even if I did compete well again, they wouldn't trust me. And it was just one of those moments where I was like, what am I doing? I go, oh, I should just quit. Like, I want nothing to do with this anymore. And, you know, that it, it ended up becoming, you know, I almost quit after that. That was one of the, the few times that I almost quit the sport of gymnastics. But it ended up becoming, I think to this day, the only reason that two years later I won two medals at the Olympic Games because I turned that around. I, I made the decision that this is never going to happen again. I'm going to become the best competitor on my team. I'm going to do whatever is necessary. And I told myself that I was completely okay with being miserable for the next two years leading up to the 08 Olympic Games. And I, I really did. I was training at 6 a.m. in the morning, going to class, training again in the afternoon, and then going to night classes, studying, going to sleep, doing that all over again. I, I literally did that for two years straight, and I was miserable. But it was all worth it when I made the Olympic team and then won two medals. And I, I really don't know if I would have been as, as successful at the Games had I not bombed like that at the World Championships. I needed that to you know, fire me up to make me realize I was being complacent, that I was coasting, that I thought I was good enough when I needed to continue every single day to try to get a little bit better. And, to remi- you know, it was just a perfect reminder that, you know, life and business and everything that we're doing, I don't think we can ever beat it. We can't beat life. We can't beat business. All we can do is pursue perfection and try to get better every single day. Just learn something new and just inch a little bit closer to the next goal. And, and knowing that, that that you had your arguably your worst day, you couldn't have done any worse in that <laughs> no, in that really moment, didn't. right? And so I'm sure part of you that motivated you, but did some part of you say, "That's as bad as it gets," and I'm still here, I'm still fighting, my team's still behind me, I still can make the Olympics. Um, some of that's got to feel good as well, being like, "All right, if that's as bad as it gets, every day is going to be a little bit better." Well, you know, the problem is, is of course I had that thought. I was thinking that's as bad as it can get. You know, the truth is I, I did lose a lot of support. There were a lot of people that were really, really angry with me. Um, but the, the, the really important people in my life came through and supported me. But, um, you know, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to explain that moment because it, it was so bad. And in my mind, I was thinking – okay, sure, this is as bad as it gets, but what if it stays like this? What if I can't pull out of this hole? What if I have just mentally messed myself up and I'm never going to be able to perform a good routine at a competition again? And that was my first really, really big major international competition. And then I was thinking, okay, well, finally I stepped up to the level of, of a you know, world and Olympic competition. I can't handle it. So what makes me think I'm ever going to be able to handle it? And so there was a lot of fear and there's a lot of fear thinking I'm never going to be able to pull through this that I'm going to be stuck right here and this is how it's all going to end I'm not going to be able to move forward anymore and so I think the only way that I was able to get out of that is by making drastic change and when I went home I was the competition at that world championships was in Aarhus Denmark and as I was on the plane flying home I remember just telling myself it's time to make drastic change. I need to take action to do something else. And that's when everything happened. I changed my diet. I changed my sleep patterns, how I was studying, what I was doing. And I think for the entrepreneurs, um, you know, people in sales and people in real estate or wh- whoever is listening right now, if something's not working, you can't get stuck in what you're currently doing. You've got to go make drastic change, not just a little change. It's got to be big. Go completely remap everything you were doing. Find a new path. And that's what I had to do because, you know, I had become the best gymnast in the country. And I told myself, hey, I'm the best. I've arrived. I know what I'm doing. I'm just going to coast from here. And as soon as I started coasting, 
that's when I went and bombed at the biggest moment. And so I just realized at that moment, okay, time to go home. And there's, I'm not, I'm putting my foot on the gas pedal and I'm slamming it to the ground and I'm going to keep on trying to improve every single day. Cause this can't happen again. We, we fall, we fail. We, we have a miserable moment like I had. And it's, it's a moment like that that makes us realize we can never let up. We just have to keep pressing forward. And I think that every single person is going to have a moment like that in their lives. You just have to decide, what are you going to do? Are you, are you going to quit or keep coasting or, or accept the outcome or put the pedal to the metal and go, go harder than you did before? And, and making that decision and, and making those changes – who, who did you rely on? I mean, you, you've had coaches for your entire gymnastic career. Was it a coach that you sat down with and said, I need to change all of this? Was it um, a friend, a family member? Who did you rely on in order not only to help you make that decision, but to keep you accountable to actually doing it? Because there's only so much we can do ourselves. Oh, yeah. D, all of the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, I had to rely on everybody. And I threw myself this big pity party. I felt really sorry for myself for a while. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I thought I could figure it out. But eventually, uh, I, I remember like it was yesterday, I called my coach. I said, Coach, let's get together. And his name is Mark Williams. He's one of the best coaches, uh, you know, to ever grace the planet for gymnastics. And uh, I said, Mark, let's sit down and let's map this out together. And that's what we did. We, I was in his office. I pulled my laptop open, open and we just, I started typing, hey, here's, what, here's the changes that need to be made. But, you know, not only did I have those meetings with my coach, sat down with my, you know, who's now my wife, my, my fiance at the time. I, um, you know, so I talked, my wife's name is Haley. So I sat down with Haley and tried to figure out, hey, what can I do differently at home? How can I eat better? How can I sleep better? How can I just make sure I'm doing everything right for this goal? Because I didn't want to, at the end of the day, have one regret. I wanted to make sure that even if I didn't make the team or even if I made it and didn't do well, that I could look back and think, hey, I, I did everything I possibly could. I have nothing to be upset about. And, you know, so I sat down with my wife and my family and um, friends and just had people help me. And I, I asked for encouragement. Hey, when, look, I, I need you guys to just back me right now. Okay. I know I'm about to do some crazy stuff. I'm about to be obsessed with this gymnastics thing for a while, but I just need you guys to encourage me and, and understand I'm pursuing something right now that is absolutely insane that very few people ever, you know, go for. I just need you to support me and that's it. And I think it's really important for us, uh, it, you know, as entrepreneurs to ask those people that care about us the most, Hey, just, just, just support there. Just, just support me. Be there for me. Do, you know, I know what I'm doing is crazy, but just love on me a little bit, and I promise this is going to pay off in, in the long run. And so I needed everybody. Uh, I needed everybody in my life to just understand what I was trying to do, why I was doing it, why it was important to me. And, you know, luckily I had some great people, you know, that, that were in my life, and they helped me out. And in the end, Every single bit of it was worth it. Like I said, when you, when you do it all right and when it does pan out in the end, it's all worth it. That, that's amazing. And, and you proved it because two years later, you're in the Olympics. Six years later, you're the captain of the, the men's um, Olympic team. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge leap, not only in stature, in coming back from um, – you know, your, your worst gymnastic day, but that's other people were relying on you to support them when you're chosen as captain. Yeah. Yeah. And it was definitely a, a role reversal because you go from the, the guy that's green on the team that people are like, Ugh, we don't know if we trust this guy at all. And, you know, in, in 2008, I, I, I turned it around so much. Whereas in 2006, I, had the worst performance in history. And then in 2008, I had people tell me that was one of the greatest performance in history. Um, and so, you know, for me, I was the guy that I just wanted to lead by what I was doing, lead by example. But then I had to become a vocal leader and I'm no longer the, the guy that's green on the team. I'm, I'm the expert. I'm the, I'm the veteran. And, you know, this isn't going to sound old to our listeners, but in 2012, I was 26 and I was, the grandpa of the team, you know, gymnastics isn't a sport of longevity. I think my next oldest teammate was 19. 
And, um, you know, so it's a 26 year old and a bunch of, you know, 19 year old guys. And they're like wide eyed at the Olympics with 40,000 people in an arena, billions of people around the world, cameras in their face. And they're like, dude, what do we do? And so <laughs> it was my job to kind of encourage them and, and calm them down and say, Hey, look, I know this is scary, but we got this. Everybody just, you know, relax and do your job. Just, you know, follow me. Just, just, I've done this before. Just, just follow me. And, yeah, you know, I think we definitely go through different phases of our lives where sometimes we're the leaders, sometimes we're the followers. But I think we all have to understand how to how to play both roles. I think it's really important, especially as we start new chapters in our lives. Sometimes we gotta we gotta watch what other people are doing and and surround ourselves with with success and say, hey, I'm I'm gonna do exactly what that person's doing until I become that person. And then you have to understand you gotta give back because there's gonna be people that are gonna be looking to us wanting to know how we did it. And you simply have to just show them, hey, I'm doing what you're doing. I, I, I followed someone for a while until I became who I am. And, you know, so I, that was always my, my mindset is, you know, just, just be there for people and just encourage them and also help them understand I went through exactly what they're going through. I, I love that point because I was thinking to myself, you know, my, my next question is going to be, how do you tell the folks out there that, that maybe don't think they have the natural ability to be Olympic athletes. And I'm putting a little Olympic athletes in, in air quotes, because it could be whatever career or business they are that, yeah. that they want to get to the top of. And, and they're like, well, I, I can't do that. He's got something that I don't have, but you just said it right there. It's following the path that someone else laid out for you and, yep. and seeing it. So I love that you said it because you answered the question before I asked it, but that leads me to a, a final question we've um you know in the olympics you you saw carrie strug and and you followed sort of her path obviously a little bit differently but there are gymnastic meets and and then there's your high school team and then there's your college team and then it's getting involved in um uh, you know the usa team and there's a path to follow that um if you're a single mind single focus you can follow that path and you did now you are in the business world, you're getting clients who you, you, you coach and consult with. You're getting on stages and, and you're telling your story. You're working on your autobiography that's going to be part of this story that'll, that'll go along with your, your presentations and you're putting together a course for young athletes. That's a lot of things to do. So you went from singular focus to now you've got five or six different focuses. You went from a path that was pretty well scripted in the gymnastics world to now creating a path of your own where you have to find people that have done it. How are you making that transition and what have you done that's made you so successful in it thus far? Yeah, no, so it's a, that's a great question. And it's been an interesting transition for me because I, you're right. I was so, you know, such a singular focus. I was, you know, just tunnel vision on the goal, but you know, for me, I still kind of only have one goal. My goal is to take my experience as an athlete, and to inspire people with that experience and whatever they're doing. I, I've just found that I can relate to people, not, not just a few people, everybody. There, because I, there is no, I really don't feel that there is such thing as an overnight success. It just doesn't really exist. And there are people that hit success quickly or, and people always bring up the lottery. The lottery is it's not real life. But anyways, you know, I don't believe that anything happens fast. And I just want people to know from my story and my book that I'm writing and everything else that I'm doing, that it's okay to struggle. It's okay for things to take a really long time. And one of the points that I really like to share with people is that I feel like we've kind of got a little bit of a, a sickness. It's a plague in our society right now, and it's called instant gratification. Everybody wants everything now. They, you know, with social media and Google and YouTube, it's like the, the internet, it's it gives you what you want right away when you want it. The one thing it doesn't give you is it doesn't give you, uh, you know, freedom. It would, well, I mean, freedom is financial freedom and success. You can go and look up anything and get the answer to your question right away. But people have started to feel like, hey, I should be able to do everything right now and be able to get everything done fast. And I want people to see, hey, even an Olympian struggled for a really long time. I have more second place finishes than anyone in the history of you said gymnastics. I led my team to the worst performance in international history. I fell. I failed. I did all of these things. But in the end, 
which took me 28 years, I finally got where I wanted to go. And so now at this point, sure, I, I want to write a book. Well, I've got people that have written books before that are helping me. Again, I'm going to follow their path. And I have gotten into the speaker's world. I've been speaking for about eight years now, but I'm not the best speaker out there. But I'll tell you what, I've been studying and researching and reaching out and trying to surround myself with some of the best speakers. And I, I'm, I'm writing curriculums and I've got programs that I'm helping people with. I'm doing coaching, but I'm not, I'm not making my own path. I'm simply following someone else's. And in a way, I, you know, someone may have walked theirs. I'm running or skipping, you know, I may be following it, but I'm still doing my own thing, doing it my own way. And I think that's what we have to do. There isn't a single profession. There isn't a single person on the planet that has ever walked a path to success that hasn't already been laid out before them. And I, you know, I think of a guy like Jeff Bezos, uh, the CEO of Amazon. You know, sure, he's had massive success, and people can say he's done something that no one else has ever done, but I guarantee he surrounded himself with other successful people that helped him and showed him, hey, here's how to run an Internet company. Here's how to sell books, which that's all he started doing in the beginning. Here's how to do this. Here's how to do that. And he listened and he learned. But still, he's, he, he, he just kind of he figured out how to walk or run or take that path in a different manner. And so that's all I'm trying to do. I'm not doing anything. I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm just doing something different and unique in a way that's already been done. And I want people to experience it from my view, from my world. And hopefully it will inspire them to do their to do the exact same thing. Uh, that, that's awesome. And for everyone listening, um, listen to that last two or three minutes that, that he just talked about. Um, you can forget about everything that he did in his career leading up to it, if that's not important. But that last two or three minutes about following the path, about learning from others, about knowing that the most successful people in the world still followed somebody else's path, put their own spin on it, put their own way of doing it, maybe tweaked it a little bit to, to their personal needs, but they still followed what other people were doing, whether it's writing a book or whether it's getting on stages or whether it's getting more clients or whether it's forging your own business or taking it to the next level. Um, I really appreciate that. And last thing for me, uh, you were 10 years old. You saw Carrie Strug in probably one of the most memorable, iconic moments in at least American Olympic history. And, you know, then you were, you found your way to the podium yourself. What was going through your head when you were on that podium with everything from that first second of saying, I want to do that, to being on the podium representing your country and having ultimate success? What were you thinking at that moment? Oh, you know, <laughs> Honestly, the first time I stood on the podium, I wasn't by myself. I was with my five other teammates. And my first thought was looking at them. I was looking to my left, and then I was looking to my right and seeing the smiles of my team. And I remember just thinking to myself, this feels so good because I, I had experienced what it was like to lead my team to a, to a horrible finish. And I would finally experienced what it felt like to be a guy that really, you know, was able to contribute to the success of the group and to see everyone get their medals placed over their necks and to watch our flag go up in the air, see the crowd around us and see the, the flags waving in the stands. You know, not only was I just proud of the group as a whole, you know, and when you become an Olympic team, you're not just a team, you're your family, your brothers. And we came together and we did something special that day. But my other thought was I never want this to end. I want the national anthem to just like keep playing, just keep looping the national anthem over and over again. I want to stand up here forever, but that's, you know, something we, you know, those moments don't last forever. So we really have to soak them in with every single little, you know, moment that we can, because the good moments don't last long and the bad moments seem to last forever, but that's just life. It's a roller coaster of up and down and, you know, it's, it's just special. And anytime I got to stand on the podium twice, once by myself, once with my team and, Anytime you get to do something with other people and you know you accomplish it together, it's just it's it's phenomenal. Well, th thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for the just the nuggets that we can all take and 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 think about differently, not only in business but in life. Um, you really laid it out for us things that we can do a little bit differently and and enjoy the highs and and learn from from our lows. Um, 
So appreciate you being here. Definitely, if everyone listening, um, check out uh, Jonathan on social media. Check out his website. And obviously, for your local events, corporate events, um, he's a phenomenal speaker. You, you heard some of the story. Um, there's more to it that is just uh, so inspirational and motivational. So uh, encourage you to reach out to him. And Jonathan, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Had a blast. Great. You've been listening to the Entrepreneur's MBA. Download Adam's free book, How to Make More Money in Your Business, at www.freebookfromadam.com.